Yes? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Mike Moyer. Uh, I'm half of M&D Moyer, and this is our stand. And because this is the United Nations International Year of Glass, 2022, getting the name right, um, I'm giving a talk on glass and its origins. What I want to talk about is a little about, bit about the early origins of glass, but also kind of the magical moment where glass became art glass uh, in the late 19th century, the way I think it is. The thing I want to start off with, the question that people often want is, when was the first glass ever created? Um, was it, I don't know if anybody knows when the first glass was created. I actually came up with this, which is a pretty good go. And the first time I asked somebody, they came up with a much better answer. The first glass was created two billion years ago. Because you get glass forming in volcanoes when the earth started to cool. And they call that obsidian. So that's two billion years ago. This is a close second. I don't know if anybody can see it. And it's probably the first bit of glass that was ever made on this planet that looks like glass. And its um, technical name is impactite. And this was found in the Egyptian desert um, around where a meteorite hit. And the heat of the meteorite basically heated the sand up enough to make glass. Um, and actually, it confuses a lot of people about whether or not the Egyptians could make glass, because they find this in the jewelry. And people aren't sure whether or not they were just making impactite jewelry or real glass. Later on, it's, the Phoenicians may have had glass, uh, the Romans definitely made glass, an awful lot of our modern myths are around what the Romans did or, not, did or did not do with glass. And I suppose, as it's the international era of glass, I should say a little bit about the importance of glass, because people don't realise how important it is. Um, the Chinese civilization is the one that should have taken off massively, but they had the problem, which is really funny, is they had a lot of China. They had a lot of porcelain and stuff like that. And the first thing you need the glass is useful for are vessels. Things to drink out of, things to eat off. And they made them all out of China. And they never realized that you could use them for other things. In the West, we didn't have as much of that. And we started using glass. And then you realize glass magnifies. And glass magnifying is amazingly important. Because first of all, you get telescopes, you get microscopes, and you've got then biology, chemistry, astronomy, and the most important one, which we all forget, where are they? Nearly all of you are wearing them, glasses. And the reason why glasses are so important are, in the Middle Ages, your average person took till they were 35 <laughs> to become an expert in any subject. That's how long it took, 15, 20 years work, and suddenly you're an expert. When you were 45, you were too short-sighted to be able to read anymore, or long-sighted. So, 10 years was the life, effective working life of an expert in the Middle Ages. Give him reading glasses, and he or she can work until they're 70. You've suddenly got 35 years of effectiveness and experts. Remember, the classic thing of it is an awful lot of the monks in the academic monasteries, their job was to read to the uh, experts who were the older monks because they couldn't read anymore. <coughs> so that's kind of why glass became really important. What fascinates me is when did glass start becoming art? And that's really about the fact that <coughs> you have to have international trade, you have to have competition. And if you know your history of the 20th century, the first half of the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century is all wars. And it settled down and good old Prince Albert in 1851 set up the uh, wonderful World's Fair, Crystal Palace, and everybody around the world showed what they could do. And it was fabulous stuff, but it didn't really move anything on, because all you saw at these were what people already did. And I always claim that probably the big moment that glass became art was in 1862, because that's the first time any World's Fair came back to the same city, and it came back to London. And having come back to London, everybody realized they couldn't show what they showed 11 years ago, because they'd look boring, so they had to move on. 
and they started producing new and more special things and competing with everybody else, trying to find out what other people can display and trying to outdo it. And I've actually up here got some posters. And I, as only when I put them up here, prints from the 1862 fair, shows a little bit about how Britain lost it a little bit. But this is the best that British could provide at the time. And it's very much traditional cut glass. It's very fancy, it's really clever. This piece here was said to be the most expensive piece of glass ever made and sold. But it's quite plain, apart in terms of colours and those forms. If you look at this one around here, if you can see it, this is some of the best of the French and the Bohemian companies and what they produce. Much more colourful, much more original. <laughs> to get something like art glass, you need, well, you need a special class of people. And in the late 19th century, they became a rich middle class, an upper middle class. People who had much more money than they needed, but they didn't, they weren't, they weren't royalty and they wanted to spend money, and then it was worthwhile big factories making glass that would be ridiculously expensive and could sit on a shelf in their homes, and you didn't need to drink out of it, you didn't need to put flowers in it, it would just be a statement on its own. I want to say a little bit about how things are made. I was going to cover a couple of things. Most of the glass you see is made in a mould like this. This is actually probably a reproduction one for the 50s or 60s, but they're, these are, um, wooden moulds and you need a mould to help shape it because if you don't have a mould the only shape you can do with a uh, blowing a piece of glass is a big goldfish mould. So you mould them and the other thing that people don't understand up from you, if you want coloured glass, colours are really really hard to make and very few companies ever did them. So people, the ones that could do colours, produce these. People say, oh it's a button catalogue. It's not a button catalogue at all, it's a colour catalogue. You look through this, this was from the company Regal, and they showed this range of gloves. This is from the 50s and it's very limited. In 1930 they had one which was about five times the size, of all the coloured glass you could possibly think of. And when you ordered it, came in rods like this. These are broken bits of rod. I actually picked these up um, by the Lurks factory. They were pieces that were made, rods made by Regal, sold to Lurks. And then the normal formula would be if you've got so many pints, gallons or whatever it is of clear glass, you put on one and a half rods of this colour, break it off, throw the other one out the window and it went into the river. And a hundred years later I find it. But this, this is what they are. And this one, it looks absolutely black, but it could be almost any colour at all. It could be dark green, dark blue, we don't know, because they're so intense colour, lots of them look black. <coughs> so, in terms of making glass, <coughs> that's something you need. The two bits I wanted to focus on were two of my favourite kinds of glass, which are the, probably the big ones that transformed industry in development. So there's two things with development. Someone has to invent a really good way of doing something and someone else has to work out how to make other people buy it. And often the successful person isn't the person that actually invents it. It's the person who realises if I did this I could make it commercial and lots of rich people would buy it. The first one is um, iridized glass. Iridized glass as I said, everything goes back to the Romans. They dug up Roman glass in the early 19th century, and the Romans <laughs> seem to have made fabulously iridized glass. And I'll get this one out from over here. Because there was a competition. Could we possibly find anybody who could make glass look like Roman glass and iridized? And it was only about the time that they did this, this was one of the first people ever to do it, they realised that Romans didn't make iridized glass. What actually happened was the glass had been stuck in the soil for 2,000 years and it had naturally iridized. But there was, they had a big competition and the guy called Pantacek, who was a Hungarian academic, um, he came up with the formula to do this. Um, he turned up at World's Fair and everybody went, wow, we want it. We, we could sell tons of this. And his reaction was, I don't care, it's a competition, I've won. I'm not, I'm not interested in selling it. 
So it was probably three or four years later on before he turned up at another World's Fair with more of this stuff. And he said, please sell us the formula to show us how to make it for us. We don't mind. And he wouldn't do it. And the biggest retailer at the time who sold this kind of stuff was Lopmeyer. They're still in Vienna. And they nicked one of his employees and sent them to work with their brother-in-law who had a glassworks. And they started making iridized glass like this. But this <coughs> wasn't that popular. You basically, what they've done is they sprayed a metal oxide on top of the glass and you get a slightly thin metallic sheen which gives you the reflection. One of the people that saw the early versions of this, this over here, was Tiffany. And here it is some Tiffany and some sister makers. And he worked out a way to make it look much more impressive. You've got a real sheen on there. Same basic technique, only done much, much better. And this became a big seller. So Tiffany cracked it. He was the first person to take the technique like that and make it something that you could make money out of. <coughs> and weirdly, one of the people that saw this was Lurtz. Uh, and they realized that Tiffany missed a trick. If you sprayed it on, you could then play with it. And this is butterfly wing, papillon. And what they've done is they've sprayed it on like that and then blown it a bit bigger. So it's fragmented. So you get this fantastic butterfly effect. And they were really successful. They sold tons and tons of this. And it was, they made sure they were very much in the Art Nouveau style. And that's what was really, really popular. But it all came from one guy invented it and lots of other people who actually had a go at it but made beautiful glass. It just wasn't very commercial. Now the other one, which is a similar setup, is uh, Kanye glass. Just going to get this one out. Now Cameo glass has got quite an interesting story as well. Because if you read all the books, they'll tell you this. The Romans made Cameo glass, and the most magnificent piece of Cameo glass the Romans ever made was called the Portland Bars. It was smashed in the British Museum, and then modern day Cameo glass was created while there was a competition again to try and make a new version of the Portland Bars. Sadly, it's rubbish. <laughs> they did smash the Portland Bars, and they did actually try and revamp it. But what they, nobody realized was that in Bohemia, bits of the cameo glass was being made way back in the 1840s and 50s. This one's actually a later version of it, but it's the company that actually made it possibly first. Harak again. And various people made cameo glass. The English found some people who could make some of the most fabulous cameo glass, carefully producing incredible pictures on the glass. Um, but it was never really commercial because basically it took one of their greatest makers three months to make one piece. They could sell it for a profit, but it ain't an industry. And you wonder how this is made. And this cameo glass is basically three or four layers of glass. They, they blow a clear vessel and then they dip it in a color and they dip it in another colour, and they might actually go inside and blow another colour inside that. So you've got a sandwich, and then they cover bits of this with acid resist, drop it into an acid bar, boiling hydrochloric acid. Workers didn't live that long necessarily. Three or four times, and slowly you reveal a picture by controlling where you want the acid to go. And then to be really clever, what you do is you go in behind and you hire people to polish the inside layer away to make the colour. So we see that has got blue flowers. That's because inside there is no yellow. It's been removed. And it's removed literally by employing people to take pads of acid and rubbing it really carefully. And it took Galay in the 1890s to work out how to make cameo glass really, really work and be commercial and sell all over the place. But people like Harak had been making it for 50 or 60 years. People in England had been making amazingly fine ones for 20 or 30 years. But it didn't ever catch on because you haven't got that trade-off between a price point and a market and a product. And that's to a certain extent why 
There was a great point about the fact that there was Art Nouveau was big at the time and glass lent itself to Art Nouveau. Um, and suddenly there was an explosion of really expensive glass that people who were well off could buy. This was not for the cheap and cheerful, this was for people who had big homes that had disposable incomes. And there were a lot more of them in the last half of the 19th century than there were in the first half and before. It's when we got the bourgeoisie, and then you have kind of like couture glass being made, things that nobody was ever going to stick a flower in, but they enjoyed. So that's a little bit about the background of those, and uh, that's really all I want to cover. Has anyone got any questions? There anything I haven't explained properly? Okay. Mm. Wonderful. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for being.